In late 1997, Jeff Jarrett was scheduled to make a comeback to the WWF after spending a year in WCW. The WWF had gone through quite a number of changes since Jeff last appeared in the company, storylines were becoming more mature, and characters were getting a little more sensible and less cartoony. And so Jeff would not be coming back as the country singer that he once portrayed in the World Wrestling Federation. Jarrett would come back and cut a work shoot promo where he criticised the WWF and WCW. And this promo would turn out to be kind of the catalyst for the National Wrestling Alliance holding televised sanctioned matches in WWF rings throughout 1998. A faction was also born out of this working agreement, the NWA stable that was led by Jim Cornette. And in today's video we'll take a look at how this partnership came to be, and we'll also look at how the stable fell apart as time went on. This is probably the invasion storyline that everyone would rather forget. Howard Brody and Dennis Coraluzzo were the president and vice president of the National Wrestling Alliance when all this went down, and Jim Cornette would call Howard the quote, mover and shaker of the two. Fans of this channel will remember me talking about Dennis Coraluzzo before in my Shane Douglas ECW video, but in this case, it was Howard Brody who was putting in the constant phone calls to Vince McMahon regarding the NWA doing something with the WWF in 1997. Cornette said Brody was quite relentless, he'd leave calls and messages constantly to McMahon, and it wasn't until after Jeff Jarrett made his return that the WWF decided they were actually going to do something with what many considered to be a fallen empire. Cornette believes it was Vince Russo who suggested that Jarrett would begin working with the NWA here as Russo was always friendly with Double J. And the worked shoot promo that Jarrett cut on Monday Night Raw is something right out of the Vince Russo playbook, but anyway, let's take a look at the promo itself before we go back to Brody and Coraluzzo. Jarrett gets in the ring on the October 20th, 1997 episode of Monday Night Raw, completely unannounced, and he says, Last week on Monday Night Raw, Jeff Jarrett was declared everything but dead. Since I refused to accept Eric Bischoff's offer and re-sign with WCW, he did everything within his power to bury me. Being the coward that he is, he even hid behind his computer and announced to the whole world that he had pulled the offer off the table. Well, Eric, the only thing you ever pulled from Jeff Jarrett was opportunity. Since I wasn't one of your boys, you put a lid on my potential. I was only going to go as far as you wanted me to. There was never, ever any ladder of success for me to climb. I was one of the younger, most talented wrestlers you had, Eric, but you let me down in mediocrity just because my stroke wasn't strong enough. Look who you put me with, an ex-football player who can't even lock up in his ex-wife. She gives new meaning to the term dumb blonde. Jarrett then turns his attention to Vince McMahon and he says Vince shouldn't laugh because the same thing happened when Jeff worked for the WWF. Vince had a vision of who Double J should be and that vision sucked. Jarrett continues on by saying, I guess you figured since you didn't put my dad out of business like you put every other promoter out of business in the 80s since you couldn't do that, you figured the next best thing would be to kill his son off. Well Vince, not only did I survive, but I walked out on you, and how ironic is it that we make a deal and get back together and you pay me a whole lot more money the second go around. You know why Vince? Because you need Jeff Jarrett. It doesn't end there, Jarrett rips in the current WWF main eventers Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels. Double J says that Bret Hart is living off name recognition. And as for Shawn Michaels, Jarrett says it seems like all HBK does these days is give silly little hand gestures to his friends in Atlanta and HBK is proud of the fact that he only has to wrestle maybe once a week, meaning Shawn's claim of being the icon that can still go is complete nonsense. Vince Russo said that it was the next thing that came out of Jarrett's mouth that done the most damage though. Jarrett said that Stone Cold Steve Austin's Austin 316 merchandise was offensive and blasphemous. Jarrett said Austin was ripping on the Bible in order to put money in his pocket. And when you think about it, this comment maybe was a step too far seeing as Jeff could have hurt Austin and the WWF's bottom line, excuse the pun. To add salt to the wounds, Jarrett also called Austin by his old gimmick name, The Ringmaster. Ending the promo, Jarrett said to Vince McMahon, You wanted the real Jeff Jarrett tonight, well, you got him. I just hope your investment's going to be worth all your headaches. 
It should have been a home run, but it was a giant swing and a miss. The problem here is that Russo and McMahon completely misjudged the crowd reaction. They wanted this real and gritty promo where Jeff would come out and expose WCW, Bischoff, McMahon, the WWF and its top stars. But the problem here was, and I'm just being honest, no one really cared all that much for Jeff Jarrett. Russo certainly cared about Jarrett, but the fans didn't have any kind of real connection with Double J, so the promo came across as a guy complaining because he liked the sound of his own voice. It should have been good, especially in late 1997, but the WWF went out of their way to make Jarrett look bad when he left back in 96, and in WCW, Jarrett didn't accomplish all that much. It resulted in practically no reaction, it's a work shoot promo we never really talk about anymore. And it resulted in Stone Cold Steve Austin declaring that he would never work inside the ring again with Double J. Jim Cornette's involvement in this upcoming storyline manifested from a series of shoot promos he took part in during late 1997, known as Cornette's Commentaries. I don't want to spend too much time on these promos as I want to cover them in a separate upload, but Cornette would trash everything during these spots including the WWF, WCW, the New World Order, even journalists and the media. The promos were, in a word, excellent. But the last Cornette commentary went in a slightly different direction where Jim would talk about bringing back the traditions of pro wrestling. So what started off as a very real set of shoot promos turned into words designed to launch a pro wrestling storyline. This was all done in very short notice by the way, as Jim was just informed that the World Wrestling Federation had answered Howard Brody's call and the company were going to work with the National Wrestling Alliance. Cornette would be the guy facilitating most of this partnership. I have to point out here too that Jim did not book this angle. It wasn't his initial idea and he wasn't the decision maker when it came to this invasion. An invasion that Jim compares to the Isle of Malta invading the United States of America. Vince Russo said that McMahon went ahead with this angle to shut Cornette up, saying as Jim wouldn't stop talking about the good old days, but Jim says that Russo is completely lying and there's no truth in what Russo said here. According to Cornette, McMahon approached him and he asked if Jeff Jarrett could become the NWA World Heavyweight Champion on WWF television. Was this something that the NWA could possibly agree to? And Cornette said there's no way that that would be possible. The NWA did have a new North American Championship belt though, and the chances of Jarrett holding that championship on WWF television would be much higher. And so that was the plan. On Cornette's last commentary, Jim talked about bringing the traditions of pro wrestling back to the masses, a return to the territory days in a wrestling landscape that's now obsessed with pushing the envelope for television ratings. And one week after this promo aired, Jim Cornette stood in the ring with Howard Brody, Dennis Coraluzzo, and the NWA North American Championship belt. There was no advanced planning here. The idea was brought to Cornette on a Sunday, and the title shows up on WWF television on a Tuesday Raw taping mere days later. January 5th, the first Raw of 1998. Jim Cornette, Brody and Coraluzzo stand in the ring and Jim says there needs to be more tradition in the World Wrestling Federation and there needs to be more pure competition. At his own expense, Jim has flown in the President and Vice President of the National Wrestling Alliance and in the interests of bringing wrestling back to where it was, the NWA has agreed to let WWF Raw present a match for their vacant North American Championship. Jim introduces the competitors, Barry Windham and Jeff Jarrett. And the crowd just doesn't react at all. It's a mixture of confusion and just plain not giving a shit. Barry Windham was a phenomenal wrestler, but by this point he was past his glory days. And it's been said that even Windham himself knew that this whole thing was a total farce, so he went into this match highly unmotivated. Jarrett, on the other hand, he looked like he was ready to make some history tonight, but again, nobody cared. The World Wrestling Federation had started the Attitude Era and as I always say in these videos, everything in wrestling has its fans and I'm sure there were people out there who were actually excited to see this match, but by and large, the audience inside the arena just didn't know what to make of this whole thing. Three and a half minutes, that's how long this match was. The time was eaten up by Jeff Jarrett performing his strut multiple times. 
And it ended when Dennis distracted the referee and Jim Cornette hit Wyndham with his tennis racket, allowing Jarrett to become the new NWA North American Champion. How did the WWF celebrate this historic moment? They got Steve Austin to come down and hit Jarrett with a stunner. Austin mocked Jarrett afterwards by performing the strut, and yes, without a doubt, this was the most entertaining thing about this whole segment. So Double J was portraying a kind of outsider. The company wants to give him a championship belt from another organization, seeing as Jeff was anti-WWF and anti-WCW, and that's all fine and dandy. What you don't expect is a full-blown faction of quote NWA superstars coming in and trying to instill tradition to the fans of WWF, but this is exactly what happened. The NWA Tag Team Champions at the time was the Rock and Roll Express, and Cornette was asked if he could get Ricky and Robert to appear on WWF television. Cornette said this wouldn't be a problem. Modern or casual fans at the time, who only got into wrestling during the Monday Night Wars, may have been familiar with the rock and roll thanks to their brief stint in WCW back in 1996, but really, the WWF should have highlighted the accomplishments of Ricky and Robert before throwing them into a Raw is War ring and expecting casual fans to pay any sort of attention. The rock and roll had worked in the WWF before, so there was footage that could have been used, but no, Jim Cornette had to somehow hype up Ricky and Robert before their match in a matter of seconds, the rock and roll took on 8-ball and skull of the DOA, and the match completely bombed. This was a new audience. This audience was more interested in Steve Austin, D-Generation X and the Kane vs Undertaker rivalry, and with all due respect to the Rock and Roll Express, they just didn't look like the megastars they once were, especially compared to the WWF roster in early 1998. A history lesson would have went a long way here, but anyway. Long time babyfaces Ricky and Robert play at heels here, they take a beating from the DOA, and the match ends when Cornette again gets involved and he uses his trusty tennis racket. The referee notices the interference and the Rock and Roll Express get disqualified. The DOA chase Ricky, Robert and Jim out of the ring, and Raw moves on to its next segment. The following week, The Rock and Roll and Jim Cornette brought Jeff Jarrett to the ring for an NWA North American title defense against Bradshaw, Barry Windham's tag team partner at the time. Windham nails Bradshaw with a clothesline when Jarrett moved out of the way, allowing Double J to score a pinfall win, and afterwards the new Blackjacks break up when Windham attacks Bradshaw. The NWA stable now consists of Jarrett, The Rock and Roll, Barry Windham and Jim Cornette. In the following week, Wyndham and Jarrett managed to score a big tag team victory over the Legion of Doom. Bradshaw would get another shot at Jarrett's North American Championship at No Way Out 1998. Wyndham and the Rock and Roll Express were ordered by the referee to leave the ringside area while Cornette was allowed to stay. Jim just couldn't help himself, he gets involved in the match, and Jarrett attacks Bradshaw with Jim's tennis racket. The referee disqualifies Jarrett, and then Ricky and Robert hit the ring to attack Bradshaw, but the big Texan makes easy work of the NWA tag team. Jim Cornette takes a body slam, and this prompts Barry Windham to get involved. The NWA then attack Bradshaw, and the Road Warriors run in for the save. Again, the WWF were struggling to make people care here. The NWA faction had to cheat to get victories, they were easy to take out in one-on-one -on -one situations, and they just came off as inferior to the superstars of the World Wrestling Federation. The next night on Raw, Tommy Young refereed an NWA tag team title match between the Headbangers and the Rock and Roll, and because Robert Gibson was thrown over the top rope, the Headbangers were disqualified as per NWA rules. The following week, a rematch was booked where Young was replaced by Earl Hebner, and the Headbangers ended up beating Ricky and Robert for the NWA Tag Team titles. Cornette cost the Rock and Roll Express this match when he hit Thrasher with his tennis racket. Thrasher fell on top of Ricky Morton, and the Headbangers won via pinfall. While all this was going on, Jeff Jarrett was racking up losses on TV. Jarrett faced Ken Shamrock earlier in the evening, and Cornette also cost Jarrett his match by getting involved. After the bout, Jarrett announced that it was time for he and Cornette to go their separate ways. On the March 2nd episode of Raw, Colonel Robert Parker introduced Double J, and out comes the old country singing Double J. Jeff says he wishes the NWA the best of luck, but that group couldn't handle someone as multi-talented as Jeff Jarrett. 
In Double J introduces Robert Parker as his new manager, Parker will now be known as Tennessee Lee. Don't sleep on the fact either that Jeff buried the Double J country singer gimmick when he cut that shoot promo upon his return. Cornette decided then to pass the NWA North American Championship over to Barry Windham, but the National Wrestling Alliance stripped Windham of the championship two days later. The March 7th episode of Raw featured Cornette and the Rock and Roll Express taking on the Headbangers in a 3 on 2 match. The Headbangers won the bout, and Cornette was left all alone with Mosh and Thrasher. Bart Gunn and Bob Holly then hit the ring and they attacked the Headbangers. Gunn and Holly were wearing new attires that had the letters ME visible, and they go on here to absolutely destroy their opposition. Cornette grabs a microphone and he says for years fans have wanted him to bring back the Midnight Express. And that's exactly what he's doing now. This is gonna be a younger, faster and stronger Midnight Express consisting of Bombastic Bob and Podacious Bart, the new Midnight Express. Gunn and Holly then take out Ricky and Robert and the crowd boos this whole segment. It was bad on all fronts. As noted, casual fans wouldn't have cared less, and old school fans who would have been pretty familiar with the Midnight Express would have seen this as an absolute joke. If the NWA stable didn't feel like a sabotage angle before, it sure did now. So what's going on here, bodacious Bard and bombastic Bob? It was all a Vince McMahon creation. Bob Holly and Bart Gunn weren't getting used too much and McMahon thought repackaging these new guys as the new Midnight Express would be a good idea. Jim Cornette was against the idea because he knew nothing good was going to come of it. Jim even suggested that he would manage the tag team but use a different name but McMahon said no. Cornette's history with the Midnight Express was what made this work, apparently. Cornette even called Bobby Eaton to make sure he didn't have any issues with the Midnight Express name getting reused, and Bobby didn't have a problem with it. And so, through gritted teeth it seems, Cornette had to go out and hype up this new version of one of wrestling's most important tag teams and try to get it over. Cornette knew it wasn't going to work, he knew the Barry Windham stuff and the undercard stuff wasn't going anywhere either and he was quickly losing all hope in this NWA fiasco that was happening in the WWF. That was until word got around that Dan Severn, the NWA World Heavyweight Champion, was on his way to the WWF. The night after WrestleMania 14, the new Midnight Express defeated the Headbangers to become the new NWA Tag Team Champions. Before the match, Dan Severn showed up and many within the company, including Jim Cornette, felt that Severn would be a big box office draw, seeing as the Ken Shamrock vs Dan Severn UFC fights had been so successful in terms of drawing in viewers. It could be very well argued that Severn coming into the WWF as part of, let's be honest, a lower card faction using the NWA name maybe done him more harm than good. But nonetheless, there was a good enough reason for people to get excited about the arrival of the Beast on WWF television. Severn would walk down to the ring with the NWA Heavyweight Championship and his Superfight Championship belts, and Cornette would carry the others that Severn managed to bring along to shows. When the bell rang, Severn showed off a unique style of pro wrestling that incorporated the legitimacy of mixed martial arts, and I truly think the WWF had something special when they managed to sign Dan Severn. Two problems though, the first being that Dan's lucrative contract only included a limited amount of days he needed to work, Dan was not exclusive to the World Wrestling Federation, and so he would miss quite a few TV shows in mid to late 1998. And secondly, well, the WWF just completely dropped the ball with Severn as an on-screen character. Dan wasn't a great promo guy by any stretch of the imagination, but his background made up for it, his legitimacy made up for it, and it felt like the WWF just didn't know what to do with Severn. Even the planned Dan Severn vs Ken Shamrock series was cut short, and Owen Hart ended up stepping in to help move things forward, but to be fair too, it did seem like sometimes Dan's heart just wasn't in it and all signs pointed to Dan not enjoying his time in the World Wrestling Federation. Anyway, his association with the NWA stable would end up being extremely limited. He only stayed with the group for a few weeks before venturing off on his own. 
The new Midnight Express feuded with the Rock and Roll Express during this time period and Bob and Bart would defeat Ricky and Robert in every televised match that they had. Wyndham would leave the WWF to go back to WCW, Dan Severn was done with the group as mentioned, and the New Midnights would have their last televised match together at King of the Ring 1998, where they lost to the New Age Outlaws. A few weeks later, Gunn and Holly would beat the shit out of each other in the Brawl for All tournament, and because this New Midnight Express tag team fought each other in the first round of Brawl for All, and because Cornette couldn't comprehend why the WWF would book this, Jim decided that he would completely quit managing soon afterwards. It was so ridiculous to Jim that he wanted no further part of whatever plans the WWF had for the new Midnight Express, or for him as a manager. And that was it, the NWA invasion and the NWA faction had come to an end. Vince McMahon didn't want any more NWA sanctioned matches taking place on television, and so the WWF moved forward while the NWA tried to capitalise on whatever sort of exposure this agreement brought to the organisation. Invasion storylines or wrestling companies paying visits to other companies are usually hot topics in the industry, and they're usually very fascinating to look back on, but this NWA invasion, if you can even call it that, was one of the weakest that ever took place on television. Destined for the mid-card and featuring a lot of guys who modern fans at the time didn't care to see, the NWA angle of 1998 becomes more of a strange oddity of late 90s wrestling that really shouldn't have happened. From a storyline perspective, there was no impact, and the WWF's involvement with the NWA is probably an angle that the company would like us to forget in modern times, hence why the WWE practically never talks about it. Anyway, that'll do it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed this one, and thank you very, very much for watching.